Good afternoon and welcome to the first installment of WPI's webinar series, Between the Two, Art and Sexuality in 1960s New York. I'm Huffa Frobes Cross, project manager of the Tom Wesselman Digital Corpus and Catalog Resonate. And I wanna thank you all for joining us this afternoon for the first installment in this series. Um, over the course of four talks throughout June, we will share the work of art historians exploring the ways in which questions of gender and sexuality were integral to the development of the art of 1960s New York. Each talk in between the two will explore these questions by focusing on specific artists um, and broader themes that run through the art and culture of 1960s New York. Future talks in the series will be by Joshua Lubin Levy on June 20th. Rachel Middleman on June 22nd, and Kathleen Chaffee on June 29th. You can register for all these talks on our website at wpi.art under the News and Events tab, subheading Upcoming Events. Between the Two arose out of a desire to expand on themes present in both Tom Wesselman's work and his papers, which the WPI has made available free of charge through its digital archive platform. We invite you to browse this archive, which contains photographs, correspondence, and press clippings related to the artists, dealers, and other key figures involved in the scene of post-war New York. Um, we hope you'll take a moment as well to explore our holdings on our website, wpi.art archives. So I'd like to turn things over to my colleague, Claire K. Henry, researcher on the WPI's Tom Wesselman Digital Corpus and Catalog Resume, who will introduce today's speaker and conduct a short Q&A after the talk. Claire? Thank you, Hafa, um, and welcome to everyone who is attending today. It is now my pleasure to introduce our featured speaker today, David Getze. David is the Eleanor Shea Professor of Art History at the University of Virginia. He has published eight books, including Abstract Bodies, 60 Sculpture in the Expanded Field of Gender from Yale University Press in 2015 slash 23, and Queer from MIT Press from 2016, and most recently, Queer Behavior, Scott Burton, and Performance Art from the University of Chicago Press in 2022. This afternoon, he will be presenting his talk titled Delinquency, Deviancy, and Their Gender Refashionings in the Art of the 1960s, which offers an overview of some key moments of queer visibility in the form of the deviant and the criminal in the art of the 1960s. So this will be about a 45 minute presentation from David and then we'll turn it over to a Q&A afterwards. Um, I'll begin the Q&A and then folks can have the opportunity to add their questions, please to the Q&A box, not the chat box so that we can pull them up and, um, and hear what you have to say about David Stock. So now I'll turn it over to David, thank you. All right, well, thank you uh, to everyone who's attending. And I'd like to thank the Wildenstein Plattner Institute um, and in particular, um, Puffa Frobes Cross, uh, Claire Henry and Jancy Creaney for all of their help with today. Um, so let me just quickly share my screen. So what I'm going to present to you today is a lecture uh, introducing uh, queer art and visual culture in the 1960s, but I will focus on one of the key codes through which visual artists signaled homosexuality or queer possibility in this period. That code centers on the related figures of the delinquent, the criminal, the hustler, and the outlaw. My hypothesis is rather straightforward, uh, and that is that it was these figures of vice that were moralized in popular American culture since the 1950s, and despite being negatively cast in popular media or even as a source of panic, they nevertheless also circulated as some of the only allowable ways that homosexuality could be put into public discourse uh, by artists who then adopted or parodied these figures in knowing ways to allude to queer life, um, albeit in camouflaged ways. Now, I've, um, I intend this as a general talk and an overview, and my aim is to launch this series with an account of the ways in which a handful of artists drew on these barely veiled symbols for queer potential. Queer art before Stonewall was only infrequently overt, and it labored under official censorship and scrutiny, so we must track the shared codes that circulated in the 1960s. 
Now, just to be clear, this is not a detailed research presentation, but rather an introductory overview. I'm going to draw on some of my own detailed research, and in particular about Nancy Grossman, but I'm also relying on the substantive work that has been done on these contexts and these questions by the likes of Michael Bronsky, Juan Suarez, Jeffrey Dennis, Susan Stryker, Richard Meyer, Catherine Lord, Jonathan Weinberg, Douglas Crimp, Gavin Butt, and Jonathan Katz. I want to acknowledge these authors up front since the format of the live talk does not as easily allow for footnotes and citations, and because I have drawn from their detailed historical work in composing this more general narrative of the decade. And I should say this particular lecture and with its uh, intentionally broad sweep has been developed from my own teaching um, and a class on queer histories of American art in the post-war period. And I'm working on shaping those lectures into a larger introductory text about how uh, the visibility and representation of queer lives and queer experience transformed in this period. So uh, some of this lecture will be scripted and other parts, parts will be free form. I will move through as many artworks as I can with their key details rather than provide full historical discussions or proofs on each. My hope is that this narrative of the 1960s, however, uh, can serve to incite further interest in these issues and the work of the artists included. So um, let me start um, with an assertion. Within the art world, there were relatively few and, and few direct and unambiguous representations of queer life or desire in the 1950s or even the 1960s. Instead, code, abstraction, illusion, or other means of indirection and camouflage were used by artists as they navigated the very real threats of arrest, violence, castigation, or being outcast. And here I'm, off, I'm referring mostly to gallery-based artists and underground filmmakers. The discussions of these will be interwoven in this talk with signposts from popular culture, film, and literature as a means to chart more general uh, patterns of queer visibility in the decade. Popular films indeed set the iconography, but it became the work of novelists and underground filmmakers in particular um, who pioneered a more robust and complex account of queer life as it was circulated and became widely received in the 1960s. And indeed, it's in literature and film that we see more overt um, representations than we do in gallery-based art. Um, the commercial art world, as it was developing in these years, was particularly inhospitable for artists who made work openly about homosexuality. But let's remember, there were plenty of gay and lesbian artists um, in the art world at this time, but the opportunity to make overt work and to exhibit it were rare. The 1950s, uh, the preceding decade, um, was, after all, characterized by widespread homophobia and the policing of sexual and gender difference. Uh, the decade has been characterized as the worst time to be queer in American history to date, um, with public panic about the corruption of youth, the wake of the 1948 Kinsey Report that had the unintended effect of making the general public vigilant in trying to discern latent or covert homosexuality, the purges of homosexuals in government and in, um, in industry, and a suffocating heteronormativity being promoted through television, magazines, and a self-censoring film industry. Nevertheless, the 50s set up for the 1960s a pattern of talking about homosexuality, albeit in negative or phobic ways, um, that burgeoned throughout this uh, two-decade period. In, partic in particular, it is the image of the delinquent and later the criminal or the outsider that became a means both to moralize about and to flag queerness. It was this image that infiltrated popular magazines, the film industry's censorious production code, and the prosecution of obscenity by local, state, and federal governments. This is a big story to tell, so I'm going to have to limit myself to just a few key and well-known examples of popular films and literature that helped establish the iconography of the queer criminal. And for this, we'll need to go into the 50s um, to talk about a few films before proceeding to the 1960s. 
Uh, first and foremost, the 1953 film, The Wild Ones, starring Marlon Brando, popularized the notion of individualist rejection of society's norms, but coupled with a moralizing tale of the lawlessness of gangs of leather-clad motorcyclists. Now, motorcycle culture had surged in the, in the United States as soldiers returned up to the end of World War II. GIs returned from the front to small towns and their previous lives, but some sought out the all-male camaraderie of motorcycle clubs as a search for adventure, an escape from post-traumatic stress, or a group identity. It was the entry, indeed, of many GIs into motorcycle clubs that also led to such events as the so-called Hollister invasion in California, where an annual rally for motorcycles um, that had been going since the 1930s uh, but had a hiatus during the war, restarted in 1947. In that year, 4,000 bikers came to Hollister, a town with a population of only 4,500, for the July 4th weekend. And this caused chaos, disruption, and uh, disturbance of the peace, but importantly, no serious crimes. This event, however, went national in 1947 with the uptake of a story and, and this staged photograph to Life magazine, leading to a nationwide conversation about dangerous gangs and a general fear of youth delinquency. Indeed, it was this event that the 1953 film The Wild One fictionalized, however loosely, and gave uh, and this film gave Marlon Brando a tempestuous and sultry role as the film's um, gang leader. Now, this film, without a doubt, and this is widely acknowledged, established the visual style of the biker in popular culture. But it also fueled a homoerotic subtext about these groups of outlaw men. The film itself often lingers on Brando's body and tight clothing. It privileges the gang members' confraternity and closeness, and even at one point depicts them dancing around in wigs as a mockery. The narrative independence and saw it as a breaking of society's expectations of proper behavior. Indeed, it, um, it uh, became a pattern for many, uh, for many youths, both in terms of their style and in terms of their behavior, and it incited questions about the effects of uh, the representation of lawlessness in popular culture. Now, in the same year as The Wild One, 1953 and 1954, there was a proliferation of literature that more overtly tied crime and exile to queer life and did so in more complex ways. Mary Jane Meeker's novel Spring Fire of 1952 became wildly popular and is understood as one of, if not the founders of the genre of the lesbian pulp novel. And this genre would become socially and politically impactful in the 1950s and 60s, as Susan Stryker, Michael Bronski, and others have shown. Um, Meeker was told that the novel had to have an unhappy ending, and this pattern continued in the genre, um, and it became characteristic of many of the available popular culture representations of lesbianism, homosexuality, gay culture, or indeed non-heterosexuality, that it had to be moralizing and show it as an unhealthy and dangerous path to follow. The only major exception to this was Patricia Highsmith's um, only overtly lesbian novel, Price of Salt, which was hailed for uh, years after as being the sole exception uh, by having a, um, a not unhappy ending. It's not quite a happy ending. Um, in these same years, in the early 1950s, other novelists, such as William S. Burroughs, wrote about queer sexuality as part of outlaw life and crime, as well as um, a couple of years later, James Baldwin's epical Giovanni's Room, which provided one of the first and most impactful accounts of the psychological effects of homophobia and the fear of being outcast from society. As well, to set the stage of this conversation around queerness and criminality um, and delinquency in the 1950s, we have um, Allen Ginsberg's uh, uh, Howell, um, which was uh, published in 1956 uh, and instigated a major obscenity trial um, in 1957 against its publisher, City Lights. 
Howell depicts many kinds of sexuality, but was unambiguous about its inclusion of queer and non-heterosexual practices, and the entire narrative focused on the outcasts from normative society. Uh, the Howell has been inspirational for decades since, and its popularity was fueled, in fact, by the attempted censorship of it. Um, in 1957, City Lights won this very visible trial, uh, which was also featured in a photo uh, essay in Life magazine. Um, and this trial and, its, and the conversations around it in the, in the press made the question of obscenity, corruption, and criminality very public and widely discussed. Um, the queerness of Howell has since that time been associated with anxieties around moral panic, the fear of the delinquent, the outlaw, and the criminal. And obviously, it's a, all of these texts are more complex than I have time to give voice to here. But I'm trying to kind of set the stage on, on the popular circulation of homosexuality in the 1950s. Um, my final example uh, of this establishment of the queer criminal and popular culture of the 1950s is James Dean and the film Rebel Without a Cause from 1955. Dean has, as um, authors such as Juan Suarez and Michael Bronsky both discussed, emerged as a queer icon since his early death. And in the 1950s, and after he had been rumored to be non-heterosexual, I'll leave that biographical detail to one side to focus instead on his reputation. His image became that of the outsider, emotionally compassionate, misunderstood, and guided by a moral compass that operated independently of society's norms um, and stifling hypocrisies. With only three films to his name, the mythology around Dean overdetermined that repu reputation. And the key film in this was the 1955 Rebel Without a Cause, which was released one month after Dean's death in a car accident. This was a mainstream film that gave voice to teenage difficulties with the repressive culture of the American 1950s and it portrayed a moral decay that contrasted with the mainstream promotion of health and normativity. The film was very popular and very contentious. And again, it incited um, anxiety around the ways in, in which youth would pattern themselves after this. Uh, and for instance, it was uh, critiqued for this reason because it would encourage or glamorize uh, delinquency. And indeed, the, in the United Kingdom, the film was censored for these reasons until the 1960s. But in the film, one relationship is key, and that of Dean's protective relationship with Salminio's character, Plato. Never explicitly, but nevertheless repeatedly, uh, Plato is coded in the film as gay. Um, this is done through a number of signals around language, comportment, and emotional availability, but it's also indicated through little hints like the pinup photograph of Alan Ladd in Plato's locker, seen here in the detail. Um, Rebel Without a Cause advanced this figure of the delinquent, not as a so, um, not uh, just as a societal problem, but also through the inclusion of this affectionate relationship between Jim Stark and uh, Plato Crawford as one of uh, being misunderstood by an oppressive society. Despite the film's heterosexual main plot, um, it's nevertheless this dynamic that, that's often seen as the most compelling to many viewers. And for this reason, the film has been seen as a site of, was seen as a site of identification for gay and lesbian audiences who are struggling to find a, um, a positive representations of this struggle against homophobia. Um, and indeed, Minio, who would later be more open about his non-heterosexuality, um, uh, and a Dean, about whom rumors circulated about his non-heterosexuality or queerness, these both became coded images of queer possibility. For instance, um, the artist Ray Johnson, who's known for his complication of popular culture sides and his recirculation of them uh, to gain and accrue multiple contexts in ways that skewed their intended meanings, uh, privileged Dean as an image in his work. Um, Johnson was always cunning with his use of queer codes and practices, and this will be detailed in a forthcoming book by Miriam Keenley, which I would uh, point everyone to. 
Uh, Johnson hinted at queer fandom and screen cultures, understanding that it was sometimes through rogue identifications that queer possibility could be, uh, could be visualized um, from popular culture. Um, and it was also how shared codes were built. On the right, uh, we have a work based on an iconic image of Dean walking in the rain that was published by Life magazine just a few months before his death. This is combined with Johnson's cutout glyphs and pictographs. Um, I'll take sort of give uh, more of an attention to him and also to kind of think about the ways in which ambiguity, multiple readings are happening in between the representational and the abstract. On the left, we have um, uh, James Dean, Lucky Strike from 1957, in which uh, Johnson has remade Dean through the addition of these Lucky Strike circles. Some have seen these as uh, similar to Disney mouse ears. Um, and indeed, Johnson is uh, often explored the subversive potential of anthropomorphized animals. Um, but these circles also hug Dean's face and point to the protruding cigarette that emerges from between these two uh, round forms, uh, giving the, the face a kind of phallic intensity. Um, Johnson also emphasized Dean's body through the application of painted patches, some of which seem to be symbols or redactions related to his uh, other play with pictographs. Um, but nevertheless, these indicate chest hair as part of an idealized uh, image of masculinity. Dean, again, became, uh, because of his ambiguity and because of the ways in which uh, gay and lesbian audiences could see potential, especially in Rebel Without a Cause, G Dean became a recurring image for many artists in the 1950s and 60s to address queerness through this figure of the, the, the um, heroic delinquent. For instance, uh, in these same years, Andy Warhol would also focus, as, focus on images of Dean as sultry and waiting. Um, now, Warhol's work is quite interesting in this regard. He will come back a little bit later in this lecture, because in the 1950s, he more openly addressed sexuality um, and gender in his work. Um, so for instance, in some of his shoe portraits with this nod to Proust, um, or um, a uh, representation of Christine Jorgensen, um, the, uh, the most popularly known um, transgender individual of the 1950s. Um, these all indicate his kind of, his more direct uh, encounter with gender and sexuality, which he would, as um, Gavin Butt has talked about, um, uh, uh, sideline shift and indeed suppress a little as he endeavored to become more widely um, uh, recognized in the New York art world, uh, taking a cue uh, or indeed being um, being shamed by artists such as Robert Rauschenberg and Jasper Johns, who more direct, who more often used coded ways of thinking about non-heterosexuality or queer relationships in their work. And as Butt talks about um, in his book on gossip in um, in the New York art world. It was a practice of inning that Warhol engaged in in the late 1950s, um, leaving behind some of his more overt work. So for instance, um, Warhol was planning, uh, he, he showed erotic um, work in the, 19, um, in the 1950s and was even planning in 1960, a book of drawings of penises, such as the one here, the decorated penis and of male stars feet. Um, but he abandoned these projects uh, as he as the 1950s turned into the 1960s. But as we all know, Warhol would later come back to more explicit representations of both uh, non-conforming genders and queer sexualities. But it happened primarily through his film work um, in in a few years. Now. The image of Dean, again, circulates as one code for the delinquent, but it's also worth pointing out that Minio also has a role to play in the history of queer art of the 1960s, most particularly in, the, in being the model for the massive canvas by Harold Stevenson, uh, The New Adam, which Jonathan Weinberg has discussed as one of the queer, uh, the moments, key moments of queer art history in the 1960s. Now, this was intended to be included in an early exhibition of pop art um, at the Guggenheim, and it, 
is a reclining male nude at over life size at almost 12 feet. Uh, it was painted in Paris where Stevenson was living at the time. Minio uh, was in Paris filming The Longest Day and through a network of like-minded Americans met Stevenson. Um, Stevenson would also go on to be um, the uh, subject of uh, Warhol's first film, uh, but we'll, we won't track that story. This, um, again, this uh, sorry, 12 meters long painting is explicitly erotic. And uh, even though Minio is not directly recognizable in this work, it is also um, uh, was rumored and circulated and also has some resemblance to him. But um, one of the things that happened was that the, uh, the curator for the Guggenheim in which uh, this exhibition was supposed to be shown in 1963, um, the exhibition Six Painters in the Object, this work was pulled because of the ways in which it so directly addressed homosexuality, not through the depiction of sexuality, but simply by the emphasis on the reclining male nude and um, at a kind of cinematic uh, scale. And it was seen to, or it's been argued to have uh, exposed the queerness of other artists in the show, such as John's um, and indeed, um, the Warhol of the early 1960s, and the work was replaced in the exhibition with uh, Robert Rauschenberg work. Now, this work in 1963 is also another moment of the ongoing uh, censorship of work that, um, that reads as queer. Uh, and it's traced back to this figure of the delinquent through Minio and Rebel Without a Cause. But more directly, the in, these, um, in the same year of 1963, this question of deviancy um, and um, queer life was uh, popularized uh, in the art world through and in the underground film world through the release of Jack Smith's Flaming Creatures. Um, I'm looking forward very much to the next talk in this series by Joshua Lubin Levy. Um, and so I will consequently keep the mention of Jack Smith pretty brief. But like Ginsburg's Howl, Flaming Creatures included imagery of non-heterosexual sex and most provocatively, ge gender nonconformity, drag and transgender capacity um, in this uh, uh, medium length experimental film. Smith absorbed exoticist fantasies of decades of Hollywood film and responded to its repression of sexuality and gender nonconformity. And Flaming Creatures took these contexts to the extreme Smith later referred to this as a comedy and a parody, but it was seen as deadly serious and regularly censored as obscene. Um, and consequently, it became one of the most famous and notorious of underground films. Uh, attempted censorship, as, as it did with Howell, uh, nine, um, when it was uh, the trial uh, five years earlier or six years earlier, attempted censorship propelled this work to wider awareness and drew viewers to it. One of the things that it uh, did, however, was continue to play on the available iconography of queer life um, and queer possibility in the 1950s and 60s, which is through these questions of deviancy, crime, excess, and, uh, and so on. Now, in the same year as Stevenson's New Adam and, and Smith's Flaming Creatures, 1963, it's also important that the discourse around queerness and non-heterosexuality was, um, uh, was being rapidly expanded through the publication of some key um, novels, whereas pulp novels and a few others had been introducing more direct discussions of homosexuality and lesbianism and queer life uh, and trans life for uh, over a decade. It was in the early 1960s that a number of crossover novels started to gain serious and different and indeed wider attention. These, these novels, however, also reinforced that imagery of the queer outcast, the delinquent, the hustler, and the criminal. The Mexican-American writer John Retchie's City of Night offered a startling and beautifully written chronicle of queer and trans struggle and it encouraged some readers indeed to relocate to cities like Los Angeles, San Francisco, and New York. And it, uh, if you read it, it also provides the locations for where to go cruising or hustling in those cities. Um, as Richard Dyer and Tom Waugh have discussed, it was the hustler in, an, in a dyadic relationship with the 
uh, the queen, the uh, the femme, or uh, what we would now um, think of as uh, as trans life, this dominated the available representation for um, for queer life. But the emphasis on both of these was seen as being outcast, exiled, and antagonistic to society's norms. Um, and in this, in the 1950s and 60s, questions of um, trans life and homosexuality were often mutually defining, overlapping, sometimes indistinguishable, but also competing uh, in terms of this. And all of these works kind of play out some of these questions, um, thinking about this, uh, uh, this dynamic. Uh, it should also be said that Baldwin's uh, Another Country, though less about criminality, also traced urban non-heterosexuality and moral uh, complexity. And Jean Genet, often seen as the prototypical um, author of the iconography of the queer criminal, um, became more well-known to American readers thanks to the first U.S. edition of his initial novel in 1963. Now, the books of these years um, following 1963 became very popular, uh, crossed over into more widely read literature and, and also studied um, uh, literature, but they all reinforced the imagery of the queer underworld with its associations of moral decline, social degeneracy, deviancy, delinquency, and, and so on. And these also included such later novels in the mid-1960s, such as Hubert Selby's novel about 1950s New York, or Truman Capote's widely influential In Cold Blood with its uh, account of murder and queer subtexts. As well, some lesser known books of the 1960s that became widely read amongst gay and lesbian audiences also um, provided detailed accounts of queer life and the struggle of the economic, legal, and societal oppression of it. And I would point readers to um, such remarkable books as Kate Marlowe's memoir, um, uh, Mr. Madam, Confessions of a Male Madam. Um, at that point, um, uh, Marlowe identified as a man uh, when, when this book was written. Or uh, William Carney's uh, 1968, The Real Thing, which is a leather sex retelling of the epistolary novel, Dangerous Liaisons. Now, through the 1960s, the association of queer life with crime and exile became widespread. Whereas it had been hinted at in different ways in 1950s film, some of um, in these books with their more detailed accounts of the complexity um, the struggle for survival and the effects of oppression. With these novels, a different conversation began to emerge in the 1960s about this imagery. All of these books uh, cemented the imagery of the delinquent or the criminal as the available um, iconography of queer. Um, but importantly, all of these novels resisted the moralizing account of it and provided evidence of a more resistant or self-determined life, despite uh, the struggles. And sometimes the novels also end quite sadly as well, but in a different way. Now, these books build on the establishment of the queer outlaw or the delinquent to provide sympathetic accounts of enduring homophobia and of legalized oppression. Criminality was, we should remember, a condition of queer life, and these books added depth and possibility to that condition. Now, it's with this in mind that we can understand better such major events in art history as the censorship of Andy Warhol's 13 Most Wanted Men in 1964. As Richard Meyer has discussed at length, Warhol's commission for a work for the World's Fair was censored because of its depiction of criminals. Uh, Warhol um, had gotten a bunch of mug shots from a gay police officer who at the time was uh, the artist Wynne Chamberlain's boyfriend. And he blew them up um, and enlarged them as an external mural, um, placed them so that they were um, their profile and forward um, and the, the mugshot forms would be interspersed so they appear to be looking at each other. These men are both the most wanted men as with the FBI uh, searching for them, but also they were wanted men. And it, this work plays off and winks at the associations of homosexuality and criminality. 
It was uh, not really seen, however, because it was installed and it was uh, almost immediately painted over by fair officials fearing controversy. The argument was that many of these men were of Italian descent and there was a fear of offending the Italian American community. But um, there seems to be much more than that because in the months um, leading up to the World's Fair, uh, Robert Moses, who, the city planner and, uh, and government official in many different roles, who was then um, the chief executive of the organization that was putting on the fair, spearheaded a series of sanitization efforts in New York City that involved raids on gay bars and so on. Indeed, just before the fair opened, the police arrested Jonas Mikas for showing flaming creatures. Um, the um, the public instead saw a, a silver panel um, that presented a mirror-like surface that reflected nothing, which is Warhol's kind of canny response to this. Now, this imagery of the criminal or the delinquent is something that's played with and thought about in relationship to the censorship of Warhol um, in, this, in this work, but he also think uses it in other ways. So for instance, in the same year, 1964, Warhol's remarkable film, uh, Blowjob, which presents a long, slow take of the face of one model uh, with the provocative title leading viewers to imagine sexu um, sexual activity that's not depicted. Um, the key iconographic detail is the black leather jacket that the model is wearing. Um, and so it represents homosexuality with, um, without uh, depicting it in a direct way. And so the, uh, the act of fellatio is coded as male-male through the subtle indication of the black leather jacket. Um, and again, in this work that um, plays up some of the, these iconographies that we're talking about. Now, this iconography of the black leather jacket as explicitly queer is um, played out in the mid-1960s, not just in New York and the world of underground films, but also in what we might understand as the, um, the art of uh, popular gay communities, such as Chuck Arnett's mural um, for the Toolbox in San Francisco, which can be understood as one of the most important queer artworks of the 1960s because of its reproduction in the article Homosexuality in America uh, in Life Magazine. This tell-all article was also phrased and, um, and, and presented as a moralizing tale of the dangerous growth of homosexual society and a fear of society's decline. Um, and the writer in particular was sent by people he was talking to, to a leather bar so he could see that uh, gay men could be masculine as well. Uh, you know, this is uh, overturning some of the cliches that uh, he had been given. This is highly problematic, however, because this ended up in, again, a highly moralizing article that was anti-trans um, and in many ways um, barred gender conforming from, an from a discussion of homosexuality. Um, and also saw one of the real problems that places like the toolbox represented as the non-effeminacy and, and thus different detectability of these homosexuals. Um, it's a very complex set of conditions to talk about, but one of the things that this is playing out is both an increasing um, uh, gender normativity within gay communities, a... Um, a an expansion of certain versions of masculinity and a ways of thinking about the, the fracturing of a community even at this early moment. So I can't go into all of that here. But one of the things that this article does um, in particular is that it clued readers in to the iconography of the black leather jacket that was no longer just subtly um, emphasized as potentially queer or delinquent or outlaw, um, in, but instead as directly about the, uh, the culture of leather sex and, uh, and gay bars. Indeed, Life magazine clued its readers into what this uniform meant, saying, quote, 
these brawny young men in their leather cap shirts and jackets and pants are practicing homosexuals, unquote. Now, just a reminder that the, the leather jacket remained an, uh, an iconographic sign for queerness well into the 1970s and beyond. Um, as late as 1974, television network censors refused to allow the production, the producers of the sitcom Happy Days to dress the character Fonzie, who rode a motorcycle, um, in a leather jacket for the initial episodes in the, in the series, fearing it would make him look like a hoodlum, quote unquote. And so he was compelled to wear a windbreaker instead um, until uh, a few episodes in. But this iconography of the black leather jacket is played out in many different ways. So um, most notably the recently passed um, artist um, and filmmaker Kenneth Anger, um, his film Scorpio Rising, uh, which uh, popularized this already existing gay leather aesthetic and also emphasized and drew out some of the questions of homoeroticism and its potential that had been de depicted in film since the 1950s. Um, and you'll see, for instance, in this um, still on the upper left, the image of James Dean uh, as well coming back. Um, I don't have time to show the film in this context, but you can see it online, but it's worth thinking about as one more example of this iconography. Now, as I um, uh, turn to a, um, a close and to think about some of the other ways in which the afterlife of this iconography of the delinquent, the biker, and the criminal are circulated in the 1960s as the only possible um, images of queer sexuality, um, it's important to address the work of abstraction as well. And in particular, Nancy Grossman's remarkable um, assemblage, um, Ali Stoker from 1966 to 1967. This work was inspired by two events um, for um, Grossman at a time at which she was trying to re um, rethink her um, artistic trajectory. Um, first, it was inspired by um, uh, her getting a big German shepherd dog um, to protect her um, as she lived in her studio on, um, on Eldridge Street. And this idea was a way of augmenting her um, through the, um, the, this protective dog. Um, but this dog became very uh, rebellious and, and uh, was difficult to control. It was unruly and resistant but people treated Grossman differently when she was with it. And she began to think of it as a concentrated image of masculinity, both for the ways in which it incited this kind of power relation, but also had this kind of recklessness uh, with it. And so she, she was uh, thinking about questions of masculinity in a different way because of this encounter. Her previous uh, assemblage works had more often interrogated the female assigned um, body and its imagery recombining it, but this is a work where she tried to identify with undercut and parody masculinity, and she did so by taking the black leather jacket as the key iconography. The other event that kind of led to this work was that um, she was looking for more leather to um, create works with, and she had previously worked primarily in brown leather, but she recounted being directed to a Bowery loft where she had heard that she could buy some leather very cheap. Um, and she found there bales of old black leather jackets and the seller um, broke open a bale for her to pick out the ones she wanted. Some were in fine shape, others were in tatters, and, but she came home with a bag stuffed with them. And in this work, she, reached, she unpacked the figural form of the leather jacket um, by deconstructing this work and remaking it into this landscape form in which the um, uh, in which the uh, these penile forms and tubes um, exit and enter the black leather jacket. It becomes a representation of queer sexuality through its excess and also a parody of masculinity that uh, was being um, that was being located in this iconography. Um, for Grossman, it was a critique of masculinity and showing how that it was receptive and could be also penetrated. It was an, also an inhabitation of masculinity by, um, 
uh, by Grossman and thinking about it as this space of struggle. And again, for her, she names this after the dog, um, um, the, uh, and um, thinks about this kind of unruly power and something that both draws people to, uh, to her, but also it has this chaos with it. Um, and this ends up being a parody of this performed uh, masculinity and thinking about the limits of gender and ultimately leading her to think about the limits of the body as determining of gender. And I talk about this in other writings more in more detail. But one of the things that's important about this interpenetrating uh, work is that, again, it circulates this image of masculinity in the abstract through the citation of this iconography of the black leather jacket and the connotations of the non-heterosexual or queer um, outsiderness of that masculinity. So it's, um, it's playing through these questions and becomes a way for Grossman at the time to think about both her um, uh, more open-ended relationship to gender and thinking about uh, non-heterosexuality and its possibilities. Now, um, I will um, just point out that this questions of deviancy is emergent in other um, representations, increasingly overt um, in the late 1960s. And I would be negligent if I didn't uh, point out works such as Shirley Clark's Portrait of Jason, uh, which is a feature length portrait of Jason Holiday, in which he discusses hustling and other criminally adjacent parts of his life. Um, this film treads into exploitation as an increasingly inebriated Holiday uh, confronts back Clark and her collaborator and their purported objectivity, which they willfully uh, dispense with. Um, the, nevertheless, despite these complexities, it provides one of the most extensive and complex accounts of queer life in art or film of the 1960s. Um, by the end of the decade, the iconography of the queer criminal was both widespread and cliche, um, but some artists um, uh, expanded it and continued to play with the uh, association with criminality while dispensing with its iconography. And here I'll just throw, show a few um, lesser known works, including Thomas Lanigan Schmidt's um, graffiti work um, as a delinquent teenager using these using stencils to um, to label buildings and objects as um, throughout the Lower East Side and um, and West Village as object art, which is to be read two ways as both object art as a parody of the conceptual and um, object based practices that he was seeing in the white cube galleries um, at the time, but also it's meant to be read as object art. Um, in these two different ways, in these meanings. And here you can see um, uh, Lanigan Schmidt, who then went by the, um, the pseudonym Mr. T with one of these um, stencils there, clearly associating it with graffiti and um, uh, vagrancy and vandalism. And so he's playing with these kind of questions. Lanigan Schmidt would go on to create other works that celebrated um, trans life, queer rebellion, and the outcast from society using um, materials that were discarded. Another example of this association with criminality um, from 1969, just in the proximity of Stonewall, is Scott Burton's self-work nude, in which he walks down the street, uh, walks down Lispinard Street at midnight without clothing. Uh, sorry for the terrible photograph, it's the only one. Um, this work originated from another um, uh, deviant work, um, which was his self-work dream of 1969, in which he took a large number of uh, pills in order to um, sleep through a very raucous, loud um, opening for a group exhibition of which he was a part, and he slept through the entire time. Um, and during that work, he said to have had the dream that he uh, walked in the streets naked and um, and then created this work after. But when he was explaining this work, he said, quote, I didn't have the courage to do it on Fifth Avenue at high noon. I did it only a couple of feet late at night in an obscure neighborhood. Well, I'll tell you why. Because the themes of this work, as far as I'm concerned, are madness and criminality, as well as the dream, unquote. 
this work and Lanigan Schmidt's work um, and um, Jason Holliday's narrative are all examples of the ways in which the, under, the registration of queer life as being overshadowed by criminality uh, also becomes part of the ways in which uh, they're thinking about the, uh, the ways to uh, represent it or to uh, engage with some of these uh, discourses and use them against themselves. Uh, another great example of this is um, Gronk um, and uh, uh, Robert Legaretza's performances, including the play Cockroaches Have No Friends, which was staged as uh, uh, a purported uh, puppet show and family-friendly theater in Belvedere Park one evening in Los Angeles, but it involved the um, a scatological and uh, and uh, open-ended fragmented script in which the genitals of, uh, or the, the play genitals of one figure are, uh, are exploded and licked and then uh, thrown at the audience by, um, by Ciclona, uh, Robert Legaretta here in this, um, in a related performances. These works also um, create the image of the deviant and play it as the only available representation of queerness at the time. Um, and finally, I'll close on this slide, the kind of trajectory of this and its reabsorption into queer culture and popular culture um, in, uh, in the post-Stonewall moment can be seen in the immense popularity and crossover appeal of John Waters' uh, many films, here are two of the key early ones, in which the idea of queer crime becomes both something that's absorbed from these histories of pulp and popular culture, but then also made into uh, something to be proud of and a reclaimed queer and resistant uh, possibility. And so what I've tried to kind of chart in this introductory survey, uh, which I understand was quite brief, from the imagery of the 1950s through to the different ways in which artists picked up that imagery, absorbed the themes, discarded the imagery, um, but nevertheless kept the, some of those key themes are how the 1960s and even into the early 1970s, some of the predominant forms of queer artistic expression were those that were generated by or fascinated with these themes of um, of criminality, delinquency, exile, outcast, outsiderness, trash, and deviancy. These were the moralizing themes that had been played out um, through these decades, but they became um, increasingly circulated as the available iconography or, or code for queerness at this time. And these are used by both novelists, but then also the artists as means to uh, interject queer content into art world spaces or into the space of, um, of underground film, and also to parody the limited ways in which queer life had been represented by those moralizing discourses. These um, are the primary representational schema for queer life in the 1960s, uh, this decade in which there was an increasing availability of the need for narratives of this and the emergence of more forthright political um, um, organization and resistant riots um, and uprisings even before Stonewall that were all happening. But in terms of the art world and its, and its representation of this complexity of queer life, it was through these limited um, reappropriated images of the biker, the criminal, and the outlaw that became perhaps the key ways in which queerness could be recognized in art and film in the decade. Things changed very much in the 1970s, but I don't, but this iconography and these themes do continue well on after that. And with that, I will uh, close. Um, uh, the lecture. And again, thank you for your understanding of the brevity with which I talked about some of these remarkable novels and artworks and films. Um, and think about this as the kind of broad sweep through the decade uh, as a way of understanding how and why we could see queerness in, uh, in art and film of this time.
Thank you, David, for this fabulous talk. You've given us a lot to think about. Um, I hope that folks will um, go ahead and put their questions in the Q&A box in the Zoom link. Um, and we'll pull some of those questions in a moment, but I have a couple of questions to start out our conversation with David. Okay. Um, I just want to sidebar, and I know, David, you said this very explicitly, you know, a lot of this iconography goes across all art forms. You've mentioned literature, um, performance, um, fine art, but we also probably should take a time, some time to note that it was also happening in music and per musical performances, a la the Velvet Underground and the EPI, this iconography with whips and chains mm -hmm. and leather jackets was, you know, woven throughout all of those performances as well. Um, so yeah, it's, it, it crossed a lot of media in the 1960s. Um, I'm glad that you ended on, um, on John Waters and Pink Flamingos, because I wanted to talk a little bit about this idea of perversity in the works that you've discussed today. Um, variations of the word crop up in that Life magazine article that you showed the first opening spread of homosexuality in America. And they do this in a way that demonizes, of course, from a straight perspective, the activities of gay people, in particular gay men, they kind of leave lesbians as a very small paragraph, too much mm -hmm. to my day. Um, but in April 65, so a year after the life piece, um, the filmmaker and activist Jonas Mikas pens an article um, defending so-called perversion. And he's speaking specifically about the filmmakers like Warhol um, and Kenneth Anger and Jack Smith, and perhaps as being a bit tongue in cheek. But he deems that, quote, the so-called perverts today have more creativity, more visions, more sensitivities needed for the creation of beauty, more than the quote unquote healthy artists, close quote. So I want to offer um, a question. To what extent are the artists presented in your talk embracing the straight idea of perversity in order to claim it as their own? And you ended on Waters um, in that regard, perhaps maybe to provoke, perhaps to own this perversity. And how does that function in some of the artists that you um that you spoke about this afternoon. Um, thank you. Yes, I, I felt the talk was a little bit overstuffed with literature and uh, film already, so I couldn't I, I couldn't even open the door to music. <laughs> no, no um, worries. But um, just to, to mention that. But no, I think so. The um, assignment of perversity is obviously a power relation in which the in which norms are put into play, and it's and propriety is asserted, indeed defensively so. And so it becomes one of these um, normativizing structures that many uh, artists or, or individuals who find themselves as the uh, performative target of perversity will sometimes reclaim by pulling it back against itself. And again, it's, it's a classic um, way of thinking about the um, the possibilities of queer insurgent is to deny the norms of common sense or of the natural that are imposed indiscriminately on everyone. And so the reclamation of the perverse is, is one of the ways of understanding um, the ways in which, for instance, the slur queer is reappropriated in the late 1980s and 1990s for similar reasons. Um, the there's also, so, the, so I think it's part of a larger pattern that again is not specific to the United States or to um, even the 20th century to take those assignments of the abnormal, the perverse, the unnatural and to own them in, as a means of challenging the value structure. That's actually a widespread queer uh, possibility that we can see in multiple historical and geographic locations. So I do think, yes, that's, that's part of it. But I also think that one of the things that comes with this pattern and or this this tool is that there is a certain romance of perversity and of the automatic nature of queer subversiveness um, more broadly that Mikas and others, um, you know, and indeed some of the artists that I would talk about that to embrace that outsiderness, to embrace the idea of the um, the antisocial or the perverse becomes a way of romanticizing an outsider status that um, that papers over some of the problems of inter of exclusions of intersectionality and also of the need for community or sustained um, uh, interactions. I mean, one can't 
uh, reclaim perversity without some support from other people. Uh, right? Like it's uh, it's a dangerous right. move. And so um, so I do think that that's the, the larger way we should understand it is both this kind of, all of um, these artists are taking these negative normativizing scripts um, like perversity and then uh, throwing them back in the face of the public, but also in doing so risk that romanti romanticized idea of automatic subversiveness. Um, some of these artists really are playing that up. I mean, I think Kenneth Anger is a great example of someone who is who's trying to shock. I mean, here's um, an interesting anecdote, right? So there's a lot of imagery of Nazism um, in um, Scorpio Rising. And indeed, some of the posters even include swastikas and things like that, amongst other kind of uh, pictographic things like motorcycles and others. Um, and these are meant to sort of shock and enrage um, the, um, the viewer, but also to kind of signal this outsider status. And he's someone who's taking on this idea of perversity and and owning it by being the um, being the destructor. Um, a, a funny, maybe it's not funny, but an interesting anecdote about Anger's um, film is that when it was screened in Los Angeles in um, the um, late 1960s, the American Nazi Party um, protested it, claiming that it uh, insulted their flag. Um, and, and police were called by the American Nazi party, ironically, um, to, uh, to censor or to close down um, the Anger's film. So that's an example of the dangers of this romantic um, uh, play of perversity. Um, so one must sort of deny the, and resist the, um, the application of perversity. Um, but to reclaim it also brings with it sometimes the um, these complexities or contradictions that um, can't just be simply seen as um, uh, patently subversive or wholly progressive or things like that. Totally. I think we can hear or we might hear a little bit more about that from Joshua Lubin Levy next week when he speaks about Jack Smith and his sort of reveling in, in the perverse mm -hmm. and bathing literally sometimes in milk in the perverse. Um, and the danger that flaming creatures did um, succumb to being raided by the police in 64. And, you know, Jonas Mikas told me he never got that projector back. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, um, there's certainly a lot of danger in, in, in acting out the perverse and, and welcoming the perverse. Um, let, me, let me move on here. I want to talk a little bit about this representation of queerness in avant-garde art um, versus the sort of straight mask avant-garde art that came previously, obviously, abstract expressionism. And is that, and you touched on this a little bit, indicative of a shift in the art scene in the 1960s New York, or did it get more queer in this period? Um, or does it just seem that way because artists like the ones you've discussed entered later, later on into the art historical canon? Um, and what do we make of this seeming rupture? Was it the societal's growing, ex society's growing acceptance of homosexuality? But obviously that's not happening already in 1964. So what is it, what ex might work to explain this dichotomy? Well, I mean, I think one of the things when I teach the larger lecture class, the things that's really apparent is that the art world registrations of, of queer life are few and far between um, unless they are coded um, up until even, even into the late 1970s. Um, the manifestations are happening in these sort of adjacent fields, be the um, uh, underground film, uh, literature, or indeed like in the 70s, much of the most overt queer art is in photography. Um, so, um, so I think there's a way in which there is a delay of uh, especially the world of galleries and museums, if we're thinking of that as uh, one center of the, of the art world, um, there is just a, a blockage around the overt representations. And so this is, I mean, for instance, Warhol's most queer work of the 1960s is all happening in film. Right. Um, and all of these places that are not part of that, even though of course there's hints. I think um, there, you know, the, there, 
the 1950s has plenty of interesting queer artists who are not able to represent things as such. And here I'm thinking of um, Jess, um, who is actually does some very over, uh, really interesting both paintings and his paste ups and things like that, but is operating in a kind of different uh, reception history. Um, Sonia Secula, um, Betty Parsons, both as a gallerist and as a um, uh, and as a painter herself. So, uh, and uh, of course, um, uh, Buford Delaney uh, as well. So here's you know some examples of artists who are working, but they um, they often have to allude to these questions and so on. It's um, a more open conversation uh, or. Uh, registration starts to happen in the 1950s, in part because there's just, there's a different number of artists. There's many more artists who have been trained on the GI bills begin, coming uh, out. And so there's a kind of explosion of multiple things that are happening in the New York art world that actually uh, diversify it. And, um, and so there's more and more of that um, beginning to be taken up. But when you know, we when we even think about the, some of the artists that I'm showing, they're not. Um, this work's not being really seen within those galleries, and definitely not museums. And so I do think there's a kind of an explosion when we think about the '60s and especially the 1970s of the possibilities of queer art. And it seems like there's a lot more, but many times these are retrospective views of. Um, the reconstruction of these artists. I mean, and a great thing is, you know, a great example is, you know, major artists of the um, 1960s and 70s who would now consider central to many of our narratives. People like Paul Tech and Peter Hujar were, um, in Hujar's case, not known as well within the art world um, or with Paul Tech with such a high degree of ambiguity that is unclear how that work even connected. Um, so I, I think there's a, in some ways that you know the the, the retrospective imagination of these decades um, is uh, there's there's both a lot of evidence, but also it's it wasn't that of evidence was not evenly available to those who were who were even looking for it in the 1960s. I hope that answered your question. I kind of got lost a little bit. So. Great, um, thank you. I think, unfortunately, we have to wrap up because we're past our time. So if anybody has a question in the Q&A box, I'm sorry we didn't get to you. Um, I want to thank everybody for coming um, and for joining us today. Please join us next week, June 20th, when we'll hear from Joshua Lubin-Levy, Director of the Center of Arts at Wesleyan University and Editor-in-Chief of the Movement Research Performance Journal for his presentation entitled E.G. Evening Gown Orgy. Jack Smith and Abstract Gender in the 1960s, which focuses on live performance that precedes Smith's iconic 1963 film, Flaming Creatures. And as a reminder, this talk has been recorded. So if you'd like to listen back, it'll be available on our website at wpi.art very soon. So a good afternoon to everyone and thank you for tuning in. Goodbye. <laughs>